Coming up next, one of the most important interviews I've ever done. It's about a song that I believe has the distinction of conveying a revolutionary message in just mere minutes. It conveys more in a few lines than most artists convey in their entire career. The front man and writer takes us through the inspiration of this all-time classic next. It's a song that has become a hallmark of the ages. Since it went to the top of the charts decades ago, it's a number one hit about history that made history. Created by a reluctant introvert who thought the song was just okay. Then he was paid well to remix his own song to sound the same as it had before. You'll see what I mean coming up next in an interview on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you are a member of that one scratch or skip on one of your CDs, your cassettes, or your vinyls, years after, when hearing it again smoothly on the radio or on a playlist, you're going to dig this channel of 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s nostalgia. The story straight from the legends. Make sure that you subscribe below right now to be a part of this music community. Click the bell so that you don't miss out on any of our interviews or our song stories. We do also invite you to check out our Patreon. We have exclusive content streaming there and we're starting a, a new series there. It's starting this week. You can also become an honorary producer there and help us curate this music history. So it's time for another episode of our show, The New Standards. This is where we cover a song that has become uh, truly timeless and deserves a place in the Great American Songbook, or the Global Songbook for that matter. Today we have a special guest. Uh, he fronted the alternative band Jesus Jones in their heyday of the late 80s into the 90s. It's singer-songwriter Mike Edwards coming up. I mean, Jesus Jones, they bolted onto the scene with Liquidizer in 1989, a great album. Uh, their single, Info Frico, seems strangely prophetic when listened to now. That was nothing. As communism fell in the Eastern Bloc and the wall fell in Germany from 1989 on, the world was transforming into a moment of peace and prosperity. It was the end of the Cold War as we knew it. Uh, Mike wrote his thoughts down at that time so succinctly, so passionately, so powerfully that they became the number two hit right here, right now. became the soundtrack of a history that was being made before our very eyes. It is one of the quintessential songs of the 90s, and the story behind it is just as legendary. Up next, singer-songwriter Mike Edwards tells us the story, and he takes us through the writing and recording of it line by line. It's one of my favorite interviews I've done, and we actually did this interview on the eve of the current war, uh, Cold War all over again. It was pretty eye-opening. As we go into the story, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, revolutionary eyewear for the times. Go to zenny.com. You can find out how to get a great pair of frames for under $7. Yeah, you heard me correctly, $7. You can get a pair for every day of the week. Make it happen. Here is Mike Edwards with a story of Right Here, Right Now. Let's talk about Right Here, Right Now, which is an outcry of hope and unity. It peaked at number 31 in the UK, but it really connected in the US and America. It went to number two on the Billboard Hot 100. Had it not run into the freight train that was everything I do, I do it for you. It would have been the number one hit. I think that Right Here, Right Now it says more in a few lines so perfectly than like 50 other great songs on the same subject combined. I love how simple you left it because it's so powerful the way it is. And that's that's very, very kind of you. Um, I, I don't mind right here, right now. I am pretty pleased with that. In a way, it comes back to that thing that I kind of hinted at earlier that I'm, I'm more of a, a musician than a, a singer or a, a lyric writer in that for me, it's always about the music with the the, the lyrics is an afterthought. Cold War was on everyone's mind in the 80s. That produced some powerful music, the Cold War. The world, Did you have an epiphany that triggered the urge to write that song right here, right now about social arrival? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it was very much what, what we're talking about, which, which is um, the, when the Berlin Wall came down. Yeah. 
it was such a, a it was a monumental thing i never thought i'd see that kind of event in my life and i've read that you were listening to or you saw a simple minds cover of uh, prince of sign of the times <laughs> We weren't a big fan of that version, but you were a fan of the Prince song. That was a, kind of an influence for you to compose right here, right now. Yeah, that's right, because it is a great song um, with, a, with a great theme, and it shows the kind of fear we were living under, as, as we've already discussed. Um, but it, it was released at exactly the wrong moment when... Actually, that fear looked like it might never happen again. I just, I was just thinking, like, you've got this wrong. You've got this. You've misread the current moment really badly. And you know, here we, here we are, kind of in this new band making this new type of music, and it just seemed like everything was opening up and everything was 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 going to be better. And that was, yeah, that's that's what it's all about, really. Yours was like a positive version of Sign of the Times, right here, right now. Yeah, yeah, and and, uh, and that is pretty much what I was aiming for. You know, there's the, the I think the the end of the second verse is is and and there's your sign of the times. I, I quoted the original um, just to uh, just to point out that yeah, actually it's 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 not all doom and gloom. The band's experience playing. Romania after the overthrow as well. Tell me about that. Yeah, I mean that really rammed it home, and we 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 just recorded right here, right now. Um, uh, in fact, yeah, it wasn't far off being released, um, and it really just it, it just brought that home. The very fact we were there, there was an organisation that that had um, in Romania had brought bands in as a celebration of their newfound freedom. And it really was newfound. I mean, we were there within, I think, a month or two of the revolution being over. And it was still, you know, there were still pockets of military resistance up in, up in the mountains. I read that the song was originally called Nelson after Prince Rogers Nelson. Is that true? Uh, you only just reminded me of that. But yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. Yeah. And the demo, as I understand it, had Prince samples looped. And Hendrix uh, solos. Then you wanted to be on a record with Hendrix, is what I read. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, the the the, uh, the guitar solo kind of it kind of went half Hendrix, half me for that reason. Yeah, you know, I wanted to, I wanted a duet, as it were, a guitar duet with Jimi Hendrix, whilst Prince provided the backing. I mean, you know, who wouldn't want that? Well, and I also read that Lou Reed's New York album was also an inspiration. On the He's going out to the dirty boulevard. Doesn't sound anything like that, but that you were kind of listening to. Is that true? I don't know. If you listen, you listen to that guitar part. If you really slowed it down and played it kind of quite a lot sloppier, it's quite um, pale blue eyes. Your pale blue eyes. It has that kind of, uh, and it was meant to have that kind of um, velvet underground type. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to describe that guitar playing style, but it's something that um, there were a load of bands in, in the 80s, late 80s, were using that kind of Velvet Underground style. And you could say to some extent that Sonic Youth had that as, as part of their, the, the kind of makeup of their, their guitar style. It, it, you know, lots of other things as well, like all great bands, they had a mixture of, of influences. Um, but yeah, it was, it was very much based on that Velvet Underground kind of guitar style, but, um, it's played quite a lot faster. Uh, Martin Phillips made sure that I played it very properly, very correctly. Going into the music and the lyrics, the opening is so iconic. When you hear it on the radio, you know exactly what the song is. And whenever a song could do that, it's going to be a pretty big song, memorable. How did you come up with that first part? Uh, yeah, I mean, the guitar stuff, as I've kind of intimated already, is never an effort for me. That that was, you know, I know the kind of thing that I wanted, but I'm fairly sure, actually, that I did start with that 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 loop of Sign of the Times, which I then just played round and round uh, and just started jamming some guitar stuff, knowing that I wanted that kind of pale blue eyes 
uh, kind of feel to the guitar, at least. I don't. The whole thing, actually, the whole the song in its entirety, including the lyrics, was for me remarkably quickly written. I mean, I'd say within a day, and that's a day at most. Probably, I seem to recall it's kind of like two or three hours. So, it, you know, obviously, no, none of it was was hard to do. I mean. Yeah, I think, you know, all the samples and stuff would have taken a while to, to compile. But, I mean, that's just a kind of mechanical thing adding in. The, the, the guts of the song was all done very quickly. Um, but, yeah, those samples at the beginning, I, again, I was trying to hint at um, uh, Sign of the Times, I think. Um, but also just, you know, it, it has little echoes of things that occur later on in the song. Well, the first verse is particularly thought-provoking. A woman on the radio talks about a revolution when it's already passed her by. That's got to be Tracy Chapman, right? <laughs> um, I, I suppose so. Again, you know, I, I can't really remember. I feel bad about it if, if that's that's what I meant at the time. Because, you know, I think that Tracy Chapman's um, a, a real artist, I think, in a way that I never was. Bob Dylan didn't have this to sing about. It feels good to be alive. I love that you reference Bob Dylan because, of course, he was the 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 voice of of the baby boomers. He was the voice of that generation that went through all that stuff. Oh, the times they are yeah, absolutely, and that that was very much what I was thinking when I when I wrote that line. Oh, you know, all these protest songs, all these social commentary songs, and here we are now with with one of the greatest bits of. Uh, social or geopolitical change in the in the last few decades um <laughs> and it's fallen to me <laughs> of all people to, to try and say, to praise this you know well in the chorus i was alive and i waited i waited for this i, was alive and I, waited for this. I always took that maybe you didn't mean this but i always took that as uh, i was alive i saw this like you like in the future you're talking to your kids or your grandkids like i was alive i saw this and i always thought that was really cool because i've been able to share that with my kids about the wall coming down yeah do, do, I, I think i think that you're right you know I, I don't i don't think that i necessarily thought it through like that but yeah when i when i review it now i kind of think well what was i trying to get at with those lines I think that's it. I think I'm just trying to exhibit that this was really uh, so unexpected, so unusual, um, and that it was such a relief in a way to get to that point. Well, on the line, watching the world wake up from history, I mean, that is inspired writing right there. The Did that really speak really to just seeing the the wall come down. Yeah, yeah, and I, again, I think it's um, God, I, I should remember the title of this, but my memory is shot. Um, I, I think it's the the end of history, Francis Fukuyama. Yeah, um, but yeah, and, and I was definitely referencing that because I was, I was thinking, come on, <laughs> you know, like here's some history, really. I mean, I, I know that I, I've got a very low brow take on what this very high brow person was writing. I've no doubt completely misunderstood what he was saying. Um, but you know, that's my low brow response is the best I could do. Well, and in the second verse, I saw the decade end when it seemed the world could change at the blink of an eye. And if anything, then there's your sign of the times. Oh yeah. man, that's, that's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, like I said, um, sign of the times was 1985, I think. 87. 87. Right. So only three years earlier, you know, uh, really in fact, I was writing, uh, right here, right now, I was written at the end of 89. What a change in such a short amount of time, I think. And it did. It seemed like at that moment, in the early 90s, everything could change like that. And it was just an amazing yeah. time to, to be alive. And, and you really captured that. Uh, the optimism right here, right now, it seemed to comfort the nation and bring us into kind of this new time. Uh, when the U.S. and Soviet Union, you know, signed the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty as well in 91. They both must be aware of how changed the Soviet-American relationship is. It just seemed like everything was happening after the wall. It just, it spawned all of these things. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. 
Yeah, and I think there was also the, the, the backdrop, um, for better or worse, of the Gulf War, the first Gulf War. For a lot of people listening to Right Here, Right Now, they may have put that kind of spin um, on Right Here, Right Now with with that kind of geopolitical stuff going on in the background. You know, I read that you never liked the title Right Here, Right Now. No, I didn't. No, I, it's, it, it, was, it was a kind of placeholder title. Thought I'd leave it there until I come up with something better because it seemed to me just a bit... A bit too obvious, and not actually more than anything else, just just not really exciting enough. Nothing, nothing catchy about it. Um, you know, it was it wasn't, for example, talking about revolution. Now that, there's there's a good title. I was kind of looking for something as strong as that, um, uh, uh, and failed because I never got around to changing the title. But you know. Guess is not a bad thing. The horns too. I, I love how the horns play into the arrangement. I thought that was awesome. <laughs> that. That's that. That's a, a, a funny thing. It all the only reason they're there is just because um, it was in the early days of samplers, and you'd buy your new sampler, um, which had something massive like five hundred and twelve k of memory or something, and um, you had these demonstration discs, which are kind of these are the kind of things that you can do with your new sam sampler. And on the demonstration disc was this this some um, kind of brass sample. So I thought, yeah, yeah, fine, I'll, I'll put that in there. Right right <laughs> Again, it was really just just because I could, not because I love brass. Right here, right now. Well, you had to remix it too, and that's what I love this story about it, that they paid you to remix it. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's you know, the um. Essentially, what it was is that the record was really taking off in the US, and people within the record company kind of wanted to own some of the some of the success. You know, it's important uh, for their career. So we were persuaded um, to remix it. We were told that you know there are elements of the vocals, elements of this that and the other weren't quite right for American radio, and you know us Brits wouldn't understand. So you know, I, I managed to say, well, look, okay, um, yeah. As long as Mike can come over there and oversee it, uh, and you put him up and you pay for the whole thing, then fine, we'll, we'll go for it. And you can you can get your remix. So I went over there. I stayed uh, was it the Empire? I think it's really fancy hotel in, in New York, and um, I was there for a week or two, I think. And they pulled the intri the entire track down, down every little bit. You know, every 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 drum they took it down to, then re rebuilt it all the way back up until it sounded exactly the same as the original. And then they released it. So yeah, I, I, I was very happy. Everyone was very happy about it. Well, the music video was so iconic as well, because MTV was a force back then with the music television where they actually played music. But is there anything that stands out to you about the music video? Yeah, I think I'm a, it's the one where all the they've got all the news footage and stuff being played in the background. I think as I said, that. yeah, yeah. Right here, right now, the world. Yeah, I think it, it's the video, uh, to my recollection, perfectly encapsulates what we were trying to do, um, what what the song is saying, and uh, as video makers at the time liked to, it had the band where they are best in performance that appeared on every every tweet that we were offered for every song we ever made. Right here, right now, the what does the song mean to you all these decades later? I mean, it's in the history books. It's one thing to have a, a number one hit in a song that kind of was the fad of the time. But when you have a song that is speaks to a moment in history, that's really powerful stuff. Not many artists have that. That's a very rare. For me, what it means is that more than most other songs, it's allowed us to continue. You know, it's kind of given us a a certain kind of cachet, a, a certain standing within within music. If uh, that one song was missing out of all our others, we we you know, might still have have some kind of career, but not to the same extent. So it's been crucial for Jesus Jones. Wasn't that amazing? <laughs> Leave us a comment about Mike Edwards. Of Jesus Jones and this timeless classic right here, right now below. What are your memories of the moment where history was unfolding before our very eyes? Tell us below. If you like our channel, we do invite you to be a member by subscribing below and uh, make sure to check us out on Patreon and check out our new merch. Help us keep the music alive. That's the goal. 
Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Mm -hmm.